I'd like to welcome anyone who's visiting. We're always grateful to have some visitors with us, and we are just uh, appreciative of you coming and being with our family here at Southside Bible Church. I hope you will be encouraged in our time of worship. Well, this morning, we're going to continue in our study in 1 Peter. If you'll turn to chapter 2, we're looking at verses 11 through 12. Uh, I'm just going to read those again. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. And so last week we began looking at verse 11, and we saw that the Christian life is a call to the internal battle, to guard the heart, to fight against these internal desires that are over-desires that are leading us into sin. And so there is this internal battle that must go on in the Christian life. And now in verse 12, that will produce works that go to the outside so that people might actually look at you, see the glory of God, and give praise to Him on the day that they are saved. And so one last review. We've been looking at verses 4 through 12. I want to set that whole thing in its proper context. We're looking at a new temple. The New Testament temple is no longer brick and mortar. It's not a physical temple. It's a spiritual temple. It's the realities that the physical temple had pictured and now they've come in fulfillment. And the beauty of God's plan and purpose of how he's redeeming Jew and Gentile from all over this world. And now the church is one foundation and the temple that God is building is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone that all is built upon. So all that we have received is from him. All that we are is in him. All that we need is from him. All that will come is from, through, and to him. To him be the glory forever. Christ. We can't make enough of Jesus Christ. You can't love him too much. You can't believe in him too much. You can't trust in him too much. You can't commune with this Christ too much. This is the place to have epithumia that we've been studying, that over-desire. Here is where you should have over-desire. You cannot have enough desire for that Lord Christ. It reaches the desires are so possible from this cornerstone. Peter says that though you have not seen him in chapter 1, you love him. And what about the rest of the temple? What are the raw materials that God is building with? Well, he's building with living stones from all tribes, tongues, and nations fitted together to make the temple of God. And so the question is, how do dead stones get life? Well, they come to the living stone. They come to Christ and they have union with Him. And now in verse 4, they keep coming to Him. You have communion with Christ. You've been brought into a marriage. You've been brought into a relationship with Him. And now we have life. There is life that comes from Christ and Christ alone. And as we come to him, we are now going to put on display the glory of God. We are now, he says, we're the priests of the new temple. Come into his presence and offer up now spiritual sacrifices, not dead animals. Come offer up your whole body, consecrated and given to God, and do it through Christ. And so we saw last week then that God's glory doesn't dwell in the temple anymore and the place that's called the Holy of Holies, but now His glory dwells and is manifested from living stones who are made one in Jesus Christ. And now all of us make Him our all and all. We abide, we dwell with Christ. We are giving our lives then together to spread His name and show forth the glory. Let His glory fill the earth. We are now His glory. We shine forth Christ, so his glory is dwelling in the living stones together as a community, and as one, we put these on display. The place where the world sees the glory of God now is in his church. Do you see what could happen here? Do you see why I'm so optimistic about the church? Do you see why I fight so hard to not let it be less? Fight your flesh to not let your life be less where you sit out on the, on the side and the fringes and you're just struggling and doing nothing for the kingdom of God. Fight that. 
this has to be what God designed it to be. So that's where we left off. And this morning, we're going to start looking at the last point of our study in this temple. And again, I see this as the connector between what we've already studied in 1 Peter and the rest of what we're going to look at now as we journey next year, Lord willing, in 2018. But I'm going to call verses 11 and 12 the hinge verses. Because now, he says, we're to be holy. The priesthood is to be a holy priesthood. Without holiness, this glory, this marvelous light does not shine from the church. And so we, we don't just gather and it's, it's just magical. We need to put on display by holy lives. Peter is going to make that clear that we're to be holy, bright, shining living stones. And then we start looking at the last thought on the temple, that we are to shine this marvelous light. We are, we're, uh, we'll be very dim if any illumination at all If we're losing the fight to our lusts and our desires that are waging war against our souls. So you still have remaining sin, believers in Christ. And it is a war and it is a battle and it's fighting against your soul. And if you are not battling, you're not going to shine the light of Jesus Christ to this world. So it matters that I'm holy. God's name is at stake that I'm holy. It's bigger than I feel good when when I strive. I want to put the name of God on display by fighting these lusts and showing a world a God who's redeeming a a lost man like me and you to put on display his glory. So last week we looked at the idea that the Christian's conduct (coughs) springs forth from the heart and our desires. And we will never be a testimony of Christ unless we learn first how to fight and battle with our own lusts. We'll never put it on display. I I, I think of King David and all that he put on display and he lost the battle in his epithumias and and he commits royal rape and murder and and the consequences were grave that came upon Israel. Are we going to fight for the glory of God by fighting these remaining sins that dwell within by the power of God through dwelling with the living stone? You can't fight these in your own strength. You'll get nowhere. The power comes from the living Christ that we now are one with through his spirit. So this morning, I want to finish up with what happens when God's people abstain from fleshly lusts and desires as they keep coming to that light, the cornerstone, there's what's called a testimony. A testimony will do mighty things for the name of Jesus Christ and his kingdom, There's no other way that God has given for us to shine the light of Jesus Christ than for us to be in a community of holiness magnifying this light. And so what I would like to do as we begin is I would like to pray that the marvelous light would be seen from the living stones at Southside Bible Church and that the whole world would see. I love when Paul wrote to Romans. He said that the whole world is hearing about your faith. And I pray that that's what they would say about Southside, is the whole world's talking about the faith of the living stones here at Southside Bible Church. So let's go to God and ask him to do what we cannot do ourselves. Father God, we come before you clothed in a righteousness not our own, a perfect righteousness now that lets us draw near with confidence. God, I feel so much confidence that I am drawing near to your presence right now, accepted in love through Jesus Christ. I'm drawing near to a God who is devoted to be gracious to his living stones. So we come to you and we ask with great confidence that your power would work in these stones. God, that you would work mightily, that lusts would be fought, that they would be conquered in the power of God, that they would be subdued, and that this church would put on display the glory and the marvelous light that we have been called to. God, we pray that you would do that work. I pray wake up apathy and and just uh, drowsiness this morning, God. We live in a world where holiness is almost an abandoned thought or word. Awaken these stones, God to desire holiness in our inner being and be manifested to the outer world. God, we pray by your spirit through Jesus Christ that you would do that good work in our midst here this morning. Amen. I said last week that these two verses, again, are the hinge pin 
uh, we, we saw our great salvation in chapter 1, our great salvation, and then Peter taught us that we need to respond rightly to God, we need to respond rightly to others and that we love them, we need to respond rightly to the Word of God that we thirst for it, we respond rightly to Christ that we believe and we trust and we keep coming to Him, and we need to respond rightly to self by fighting our sin that is still within And so this way, he says, now you'll be a testimony to the world. Take care of the inner heart, and your outer conduct will be excellent. And so Peter's going to go from verse 11 now to show how we will show forth this marvelous light. We're aliens. And these aliens, in verse 12, you will silence your critics, and, and you might even, they might be converted by your excellent behavior in the day of their visitation. And then in verses 13 through 17, he, he's going to show us how we shine the light as citizens. In verses 18 through 20, how we shine the light as servants and then as followers of Christ. And then in chapter 3, how do you shine the light as wives to disobedient husbands? And then we'll look at just a general conduct among the unsaved in verses 8 and following of chapter 3. So he, here's kind of the realm or the stage in which we show forth our faith. This is our witness. This is our testimony. And it is essential, if God is going to get glory, that we live these kind of lives for His name's sake, not my name's sake, that they would see my good deeds and glorify my Father who's in heaven. And so in our day and age, these kind of people will stand out like crazy. (laughs) May we give ourselves to this great endeavor. You, You will be a bright light in the midst of a very, very dark world. So look with me. Let's take up verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. This word for excellent means lovely, fine, winsome, noble, or just that word excellent. Keep your behavior, I like that, excellent among the Gentiles. This is really the highest kind of goodness that there is. Have behavior that is Excellent and beautiful and winsome as the world looks at us. I would use the term Christ-likeness. Uh, moral excellence is what we looked at at Second Peter on Friday night with the college group. Have a moral excellent. I, I'd be like Christ. You know what it said about Christ? He went around doing men good. He was a do-gooder. And he just went and did men good. He, he, he shone that light of his glory. And this is how we are to live among the Gentiles, this unbelieving world. We're to live, this is the quality of our redeemed life must be visible to the world. When you're born again, it's just got to break out. It has to get out, and that's what this is talking about. Your redeemed life must be manifested and shown forth to this world. And so the heart of evangelism, if you have a passion for evangelism, and you should because you've been born again, you start with inner purity. You fight against these lusts, and then you look for outer fruitfulness. And so you can't skip that. You can't just say, I'm going to go be a testimony why I don't fight my lust. You're going to hurt the kingdom more than you will ever help it doing that. So how will the world respond to people like this? Well, Peter tells us in verse 12 two ways. So that the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, so they're going to slander you. Don't be surprised at that. They will slander you and start making fun of you and say, oh, you're evildoers, look at your, you do this, you do that. They're going to come after you. But the second thing Peter says is they may glorify God in the day of their visitation on account of your excellent behavior. There may be a day when they get saved and they're going to be thanking God for your testimony and how it was salt and how it worked in their lives. So here's the whole Bible in a nutshell We're told that there are only two responses to Christ. Remember back to verses 6 through 8. There's always only been two responses to Christ. You surrender to Him or you reject Him. Those who believe and trust in the cornerstone or those who reject it and they stumble over it. There's only two responses. And and I'm thinking of Simeon. I'm going to preach on him next week. He he just says there's two responses. This Christ is going to reveal many hearts. And he's going to, some are going to love this cornerstone and some are going to reject it. In the Corinthians, Paul says that Christ is either foolishness to you or he's the power of God unto salvation. He's going to be one or the other. Two thieves, one is mocking him and one says, God, remember me today in paradise. 
And so if we walk like Jesus, if we reflect him and his character to this world, what's going to happen to us? They will slander us and they will ridicule us as evildoers or they will glorify God in the day of visitation. And so the question is, how, how does this happen? How does this happen? Well, a couple chapters later, one chapter later, Peter says this, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Set him where he belongs, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you. I want you to hear that. He asks, they ask you. You don't keep saying, let me tell you, that they're actually going to ask you to give an account for what? For the hope that's within you. The hope that's within you and do it with gentleness and reverence. So they're going to look at your life and, and your Christian behavior, and for a season they might make fun of you, but there might be a day when they will glorify God when they're saved for what they saw inside of you. So how does that work, Peter? Well, as you go out into your neighborhoods, to your families, to your work, to your school, your sports teams, wherever it is, they're going to look at us and they're going to see your outward behavior. And as they look at your outward behavior, it causes them to ask about your hope. And what's your hope? Your hope is this inward disposition, this inwardness that has found hope in the gospel and they can see it by your outward behaviors. And they're going to actually, they're not going to say, hey, how come you are doing the... What's the hope within you? You're different than anyone else in this world, and I know that there must be something within you that makes you live this way. What's the hope within you? The way that you're living is so different from anyone else in this neighborhood, in this office. What is, what is the hope within you? They scratch their heads, and they say, you have some kind of hope that's different than mine or anybody else I know. Your desires for money are so different. Your desires for sex don't fit this culture. Your desire to climb the corporate ladder and cut anyone's throat along the way doesn't fit. Your tongue doesn't join in the gossip of, the, of all the people at break. Your desire for food and leisure do not drive you. You're, you're different. What is the, what's the hope within you? You've fought those desires in verse 11. You've fought against them, and now somebody wants to know, why are you so different? Because your lusts, your epithumias don't drive you like everybody else in the office. What, what's so different about you? Tell me. I need to know what's the hope within you, the bright light of Christ. You've been slowly weaned away from all those false hopes and de deceitful desires, You've been being weaned from them and sanctified, and, and, and you see through this world. You don't have to get the gusto and grab it all now, and you just walk to the beat of a different drummer called Livingstone, and, and I, I see this, and I want to know. I got to know. You've been led to the light toward God, toward His amazing promises. You've been led toward His person, His fellowship, His love. You've been born again into a living hope of His inheritance. And this changes your outward behavior. You look different, almost like an alien. You're from another country, as Peter began this epistle. You don't look like anybody else. You kind of seem like you're just passing through, like your citizenship's in heaven or something. And what starts to come out of this hope is that you are fighting your less. You're fighting them because of this blessed hope in Christ. And there's a humility that's starting to come out of you that this world is not humble. And when a true godly humility comes out, they're going to ask. So when you start loving the way you should, that, that's going to be noteworthy. That you're not a slave to fear. Our world is a slave to fear. And when they see someone who is not a slave to fear, what's the hope within you? Why aren't you afraid? Why are you not running after the next thing that's going to satisfy you like everyone else? Why do you have self-denying generosity? Why do you have a joyful simplicity to you? Why, why are you so happy in your marriage? I didn't think that was possible. Why in trials are you calm and you're not falling apart like everybody else in this neighborhood? Why do you have peace? These behaviors in the outer life are going to come forth when your desires are in God and the world is they're going to want to know. They are going to want to know. 
And it will be one of two things. They're going to be, you're going to be salty, and they're going to hate you. They're going to hate that you have it, and they're going to have to disprove you because no one can really have this. And so they're going to turn against you and come against you and try to disprove you, or you're going to make them thirsty like salt. You're going to make them thirsty for the living water that you're drinking from, and they're going to want some of that water. That's what's going to happen with this kind of a life. So that's kind of a bird's eye view of this text. And now let's drill down a little further, and I want to come away with some application. Uh, This isn't a tricky passage to understand. (laughs) It's just tricky to apply and live out. And so let's take a look at verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. The first point that I want to make sure that you don't miss is this, is being born again is an internal experience. People will see it worked out into your life. So it's not enough to run about just telling everybody how much you have changed. That's not going to get it done. It must be seen by others. Look at verse 12. It says, as they observe your good deeds. So there's something to see. If all you do is tell everybody about it and there's nothing to see, you're crippling your message. And so this is something that they are actually going to observe. They're watching you, and they're seeing it with their own eyes. The watching world will see the change. It will be noticed, and they don't have an explanation for you, so they've got to ask you for the explanation. There was a Puritan who said, the first person to see that you are born again will be your horse. Let me explain that, because not many of you came in in a horse. This was the 16th century where that was what you had. And so what he meant is the horse will know the difference because you're going to be more compassionate and kind. And so maybe for us, it's your dog. You know, your dog will be the first one to notice. And that's been hurting my assurance because of the way I treat Rudy. (laughs) So just know that there's a public test. If you've been saved, there's a visible effect to your life, people will see your good deeds. They will observe your excellent behavior. And then will come the conflict. And some are going to be so attracted to you. And some are going to be repelled. Attracted or repelled. And that is a really good sign. I want to make sure that you get this. Because some, if the world starts slandering you, uh, you, what did I do wrong? And you fall apart. I get counseling all the time. Why are they treating me this way? Why is this happening? I can tell you why it's happening. God promised it. You're being a light. You're being what you should. And some are being offended by it. In many cases, it could be because you're doing what is right. So someone could hate you and your family because you're doing what is right. And so what you don't want is, is this is what I hate, a tepid response to you. You just don't want everyone to think you're a good guy. I hate that. You're a good guy. Just (laughs) You've lost your saltiness if that's all you are. We have mastered how to be a Christian and live in such a moral and nice way that everyone likes us. The church has turned off the light and it's just nice and moral and people are doing a lot better with Christianity nowadays because they're not shining and convicting and causing them to be repelled by this message. Start living and speaking like Jesus Christ and you're going to get more extremes to how people respond to you. That is how they responded to Jesus. I enjoyed, uh, I don't know if enjoy is the right word, but Sean, where's Sean Kissman? I loved him standing and preaching the narrow way uh, at his father-in-law's funeral. And it was fun to sit there and watch some people just enamored and some people looking like they wanted to grab him and throw him out the door. And I just was smiling going, I'm so glad to see someone else be hated by people while you're standing there telling them there's one narrow way and there's only one way into the kingdom of God. That's beautiful. That is not a tepid response when you start proclaiming stuff like that. John 7, we're told that Jesus' own brothers didn't believe in him, and others were coming from all over just to touch the hem of his garment. There were both responses. Some were extremely attracted to Christ and came, and then some, his own brothers, wouldn't even believe in him. We should mess with people. Slander slander you, and then glorify God one day because of your life? Do people say you are different in a beautiful way? 
Do people see the beautiful difference? Are they scratching their heads over you? I loved when uh, Tim Tebow was our quarterback. And what I loved is I would turn on talk radio, which I never do, but there was a purpose. And everybody is talking on talk radio, KOA, and they're talking about his faith and his testimony. And is it right? Should he be doing this? And all of Colorado is talking about Jesus Christ because of just some football player who's giving God all the glory that he can. And, and what I found is everyone either hated that man or they loved him. There wasn't any in between. That's what we're looking at. Reggie Sanchez came here and preached. He was our first church plant. What I love about Reggie is you either love him or they hate him. And there's a reason because that brother is so faithful to truth. And he lives it out and he will speak it and say it. And it's, there's just no in between. That's what we're looking for. There should be a wonderful attraction to you. You're humble. You're loving. You're honest. You're respectful. There should be a beauty of attraction. One preacher said, people who are not Christians still think that only the very holy can draw near to God. And so they say, I'm not Mother Teresa or anything, so, you know, I can't do that. And so if you say, I know God, they laugh at you because you can't be that holy. You're not that good. And so now they will spend their days looking to prove that you're not. And they'll slander you as an evildoer to prove it, to clear their conscience. And so get this, we're going to be hated or rejected on account of Jesus. And when you stand for truth in your family, this Christmas, instead of just enjoying the ham, and you really do bring some truth, and some of these things, you might be hated in your own family, your office, you might be the, the laughing stock of it. I was talking to one of the young gals in our church, and she is a testimony, and everyone makes fun of her. And they're always like, oh, we know you don't want to go do this. You don't want to go do that. She's just this bright light, and some are attracted, and some are slandering her. That's what will happen. And, the, and Peter's telling us, expect it. Tim Keller, a preacher in New York, pointed out something interesting. I heard him preaching on this subject. And he said that, he said, minority groups... In our country, when negative things happen to them or they're distorted and how they're being thought about in a society, he says they scream bloody murder. They'll say that's unfair, that's a bias. And he says minorities have a right to help the majority of culture not to have a negative view of them. And so it's right for someone uh, who's homosexual not to be beat up by others in a community. That's wrong, and they have a right to not be treated that way. It's, it's right for blacks to be treated with justice and equity and not uh, treated improper uh, by uh, government officials or anything in that area. All these things that happen in our fallen community, they're right to try to help society understand that's not how you act. But what I'm getting at is this. Christians have to expect to be misunderstood. We can't stand and protest about our bad treatment. When people look down on us and reject us and malign us, and, and our calling is not to spend the rest of our days fighting for our rights as a church. And so hear this. We can't assume the same posture as other minorities, and I believe that Christians are a minority, and that we can't take on the other posture because there's a world that hates us because we're a minority group that's mistreated and hated more than any other group in the world. That people would rather not live next to a born-again Christian than anyone else in the world. And so there, there, there is a, a bias against Christians, and there should be. That's a good sign. I like it. I like that they don't like us, because that's a sign that you're reflecting Jesus Christ to this world. So Keller says, we believe that God has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. We believe that he died on a cross for us and he now speaks to us through his word and spirit. And one day he's going to come and judge the living and the dead based on what you did with his son. And if you reject him, you will spend eternity in hell and it will never end. That's, that's our message and that's going to make our culture go crazy. That's going to make them hate us. So don't take away the message to get them to like you. Hold this message out, but expect I'm going to be rejected, slandered, and maligned. Don't spend your days fighting for your rights as Christians. 
silence them by your excellent behavior. The church has taken up their fight for their rights. And they've spent more time on trying to turn moral and government stuff. They've spent all their days on the wrong thing. That isn't our calling. Peter's saying, it's going to come. But silence them. There is something that you are called to do. Silence them as they observe your excellent behavior. And so just hear this loud and clear. The world is to see our good deeds. And some will glorify our God who is in heaven. There is a good observation that someone made. He said, few people will be drawn to Christ through preaching. Few will listen to preaching. So if you're here and you're an unbeliever and you're listening to the preaching, thank you. uh, I appreciate that. But what our world is most interested in is what? What works. That, That is all they, what works. That's what they're looking for. Does Christianity really help you with your problems? Does it really help you with your troubles and your fears and your anxieties and your sleeplessness and your relational conflicts? Does it really help you at the hour of death and then past death? Does Christianity really work? May they look at us and see our excellent behavior and glorify God because of our good deeds and say, yes, it works. I, I want to be the, the apologetic to the world that with all those questions, does it work? Your exhibit A, it works. I can't explain you what's the hope within you. There, there is something. What is it? Few people have seen a person like Jesus Christ. And that is what they need so desperately in our day and age. And so the question from this series is simply this. Are you an enigma? Are you an invitation to Christ? What is your life saying? That old quote, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? What what are you to this world? Are you the same grumbling, complaining, bitter, full of anxiety person as everybody else in this world? Because they're never going to ask you, what is your hope? And I want to show them the power of God transforming a life. We have to answer this with honesty. And so I'm going to get out there and be bold and say, go ask your wife. (laughs) Go ask your kids. And just go ask your friends. Is my life a billboard for the excellencies of him who has called us to his marvelous light? There's only one tool that God has given to silence the critics that accuse us as evildoers. I was reading just in the early church some of the claims that unbelievers said. They said they're insurrectionists. They're atheists, they're cannibals, cannibalism with the communion table, they're immoral, they have incest, they're wrecking homes, they're breaking up homes, they're slaves in rebellion, they're they're putting our slaves into rebellion, Uh, they're hating men, they're disloyal to Caesar, they've been mocked and accused in every direction. (laughs) You're going to be accused, and there's one answer to all of this. An, ex- an excellent life. That's how we're to shut them up. To just, I'm not going to argue and say, well, you don't see me on Sundays. You should see the way I am. Here's my excellent life. Look at it. Observes in the present tense verb. They're going to be observing your life. It's not just one day a week. They observe who you are, what you are, how you respond to different seasons of life. They're observing it. And it says that that the other way then in verse 12 is that they might, as they observe them, they might glorify God in the day of visitation. And so this is a little tricky to translate. The New Testament, uh, as you look through visitation, it's used quite frequently in the Old Testament and it referred to a lot of different things. But interestingly, in the New Testament, every time this word is used, it referred to the visit of redemption. The visit of redemption, I'm going to read you a couple of verses where this word is used to show you why I'm going to take my interpretation that I do of what does that mean in the day of visitation. Listen to Luke 1.68. Uh, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has visited us and accomplished redemption. So this visitation is that He came and He's come to accomplish redemption. Then later in Luke 7, fear gripped them all and they began glorifying God saying this, 
a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. So he has come to bring about salvation. And then one more in Luke 19, 41. And when he approached Jesus, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. And for the days shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You missed that Jesus Christ, God himself, Messiah, came into the world. You missed the day of your visitation. And so the word is really used to refer to the visitation for salvation. And Peter would have understood that because he would have heard Christ uh, teach that way and share this. And so just in bringing it all together then, as unbelievers observe the character of an unbeliever's life, and here's a present tense, as your continual life is being lived out, as they watch it, grace moves, and and it might bring them then to saving faith as they're observing this. And, and when that happens, when, when they see your life and then they want to know the message of what is the hope, what changed you, and you share the cornerstone, and if they come to see him as glorious and believe, and now they quit stumbling over him and they receive him, then they're going to be saved. And what happens is at that time, it says they're going to glorify God. Thank you, God, for the tremendous testimony of the believers that I saw who lived this out before my eyes, and I persecuted them, I rejected them, and now, God, thank you. Thank you for those bright lights that manifested Jesus Christ to me. This is absolutely amazing. We're going to remember the lives of the faithful Christians that God brought into our lives that made the gospel so attractive. I, and I, just, I really want you to raise your hand. If you remember a testimony that God used of someone who led you to Jesus Christ, I want you just to raise your hand. That's a lot. That's, that's, that's a lot. So I want you to see that this is, this is it. This is it. And you made the gospel so attractive, even if we slandered them. I remember when I was saved, a few came flooding back into my life. In high school, there was this girl who I was at a party, and the sister, the older sister of the girl that was having the party, uh, she had just been saved, and she came in just preaching the gospel to all these inebriated high school kids, and she's just sharing, and man, I slandered her, I ridiculed her. But when I went home that night, I kept thinking, why would that girl be willing to be humiliated and embarrassed in front of all those people? It, it got in my head. And then I started dating a girl named Laura, and praise God for her. And there was something so beautiful about, different about her, and, and beginning to find out and see and the, the testimony of that life. And then God brought into my life, my, there were seven boys in my family, and my middle brother in the middle of the family got saved. His name is Steve, and he was dating this beautiful girl named Kim. And Steve and Kim were uh, just a bright light of the gospel. And I remember my brother Steve would come over, and he, we'd have dinner at the table, and me and all my brothers would start taking the Lord's name in vain and cussing and doing whatever we could to just get at him. And all he would ever do is bow his head and just pray. And it made me madder and madder and filthier and just, we would just abuse him. And all he would do is just keep manifesting this beautiful Christ-like behavior and we couldn't get to him. And I'll never forget when I walked down the aisle at Mile High Stadium when a man named Billy Graham was preaching I just remember sitting there and hearing it and my heart being melted and saying, I want to surrender my life to the cornerstone. I I see this. I see all of his beauty. And as I came down, they had these leaders who would sit with you and kind of go over the gospel and make sure you're understanding it. And my brother was the the one who was chosen to, to lead that. And so I got to sit down there and as he was going over peace, how to have peace with God and sharing with about six of us sitting in a circle 
I remember just looking at him and thanking the Lord for that dear man of God who made Christ absolutely irresistible to me. The most effective tool of evangelism that we possess is the life that we live before the Gentiles. And I pray that God would get the glory for our excellent lives. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you for those excellent lives that the show of hands, so many in here who saw that in their unbelief and that saltiness and that light was used of you to lead them to glorify you in the day of their visitation. And so, Lord, we thank you that cornerstones can reveal this marvelous light. Lord, as we join together in that bond of our cornerstone and we commune with him and we find power in and through him and in that power to fight lust, to fight these desires that are fighting against our soul to destroy us. And if they destroy us, we give you no glory at all. We defame your name. And so I thank you, God, that as this cornerstone is empowering us and giving us desires both to will and to do uh, your good pleasure. And so, Lord, thank you. And I pray that we would be just recommitted as a church to fight lust over desires, epithumias like never before. God, wake us up to that battle. Encourage our hearts in that fight. And then, Lord, I pray that you will use us, that your glory would fill the earth. And that from this, these living stones, God, that your glory would be put on display and people would see this marvelous light by the, the beauty of those who are beholding Christ and becoming like him. And that the world would have no explanation, that they would look and just say, what's the hope within you? God, I pray that we would show them that and, and that they would see the beauty. And so, Lord, help us. Help us, we pray. God, let us be awakened to um, fighting and trying to fight for our rights and all the things that we deserve instead of realizing that what we deserved was hell and we received amazing grace, abundant life. And in that now, Lord, we just want to shine. We want people to observe the power of God working within us, coming from the inside to the outside and that, that people would have to know there's a God that they couldn't suppress. They suppress the creational truth that you're there. Don't let them suppress the relational truth of having to rub shoulders with us every day as we uh, rub hearts with Jesus Christ and commune with him. And so, God, let that, let that be a powerful testimony. Let our best apologetic be our faithful lives. God, I pray, awaken every soul in here to uh, shining this light, to not be content with just learning truth and sitting on it. God, this must shine. Wake us up. Don't let us stay in comfortable little lives that don't get persecuted. God, let us be persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ, working in our lives and shining. Lord, thank you for this, and it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.